In depth on this Friday, we're going to talk about colon cancer today and the importance of regular screenings. Did you know your chance of being diagnosed are just one in 20? That's why the screenings are so important. The American Cancer Society says to get checked at the age of 50, and that includes a colonoscopy. Dr. Randy Schott takes us in depth with a surgeon and a colon cancer survivor. Joining us now is Dr. Lori Slezak, a colorectal surgeon in the Tampa Bay Outpatient Surgical Facility. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Slezak. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So today we were talking to Laura, who was a patient of yours, about her colon cancer and her recovery. And she doesn't fit the stereotypical issues, so could you tell us some risk factors for the average colon cancer patient? Yeah, there are several risk factors that we've identified. Um, certainly probably one of the most significant is having a relative, particularly a first degree relative who was diagnosed with colon cancer. So those patients we consider higher risk. Um, women, especially with a history of breast, ovarian, uterine cancer, um, thyroid cancer may increase colon cancer risk. Um, anyone who has Crohn's disease or ulcerative of colitis is at increased risk. And certainly anyone who has unusual symptoms, um, we would consider screening earlier. Now the average person is going to be screened around the age of 50, so those are the high risk ones. It's a dreaded topic, but we have to talk about it. Colonoscopies, sigmoidoscopies, kind of run us through that process if you could. Yeah, a colonoscopy is, is pretty much the best test not only to diagnose polyps, which are the precancer lesions to colon cancer, but it treats the problem as well. So not only do you uh, get the opportunity to make the diagnosis of polyps, but under that same procedure, you remove the polyps as well, thereby providing therapy to the patient. So it's really the only test out there that is not only diagnostic, but therapeutic as well. And it's a test. Sorry. Sorry. And then the, they're asleep, which is a kind of important piece. So prep is probably the worst part, but they don't feel anything and they wake up and the test is over. That's correct. Most of us use uh, sedation for a colonoscopy, so patients are asleep, comfortable, completely unaware. When they wake up, the procedure's over, they feel well, they leave the facility, and really within a few hours, they feel uh, very much back to normal. Um, the day before, obviously, um, has gotten a lot better in the last five, ten years because the preps have become much more tolerable. So I think even that day, it's basically one day of a clear liquid diet and then a lavage in the late afternoon. And my patients tolerate it quite well. And honestly, to prevent a really bad, aggressive disease, most people find it worth it. Absolutely. Now, you're in an outpatient facility now. Is there any benefit for outpatient versus inpatient for this study? You know, I think that for healthy individuals, um, an outpatient facility provides the same level of care, um, certainly is much more cost effective than a hospital, and I think the nursing staff and the ancillary staff are under a lot less pressure because these are smaller facilities, so I think um, patients probably get a little bit more um, attention. Uh, at an outpatient facility, certainly it benefits the insurance companies because it's a lot less expensive and it's really the same procedure. So for a lot of reasons, for young, healthy individuals, outpatient facilities are a great venue for this procedure. All right, well, we appreciate the information. Can you give us some parting words? Prevention is kind of a primary piece for me. Can you tell us what we should do to prevent colon cancer so they don't have to come visit you? Well, unfortunately, you're still going to have to come visit me. Um, I think keeping your diet um, low in saturated fat, having a healthy diet, exercise, all the things that we think are generally important for good health, I think are good for colon cancer prevention. There are some um, early studies that indicate that perhaps an aspirin a day, if there's no um, reason that an individual can't take an aspirin a day, that may be um, preventative of some cancers, including colon. Um, and then screening, because since we don't actually know how to prevent polyps, really the next best thing is to screen patients, look for polyps, remove them, and stop that whole process from happening. It really is truly a preventable cancer. And Laura is very lucky that that she had a physician who recognized early signs and symptoms, even though she was only in her 30s, you know, and got her the treatment that she needed. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great information. I'm sure our viewers will appreciate it. Sure. My pleasure. Joining me now is Laura Webb. Now, Laura is a very impressive person. We've talked for a few minutes on a lot of things, but one of the things we're talking about today is colon cancer, and you have the duteous honor of telling us how you survived colon cancer, and that's a big deal for us. So. What I'd like to start with is figuring out how did you know you had colon cancer to start with? Yeah, you know, I actually was very fortunate. I had had a pain for quite 
mm, couple months or so um, on my left side where your appendix would be but on the other side of your body obviously and I happened to mention it to my gynecologist when I meant, went in for my annual exam and she said you know I'm sure it's nothing but go see the GI and the GI said I'm sure it's nothing but let's do a colonoscopy and afterwards in a room about this size you know is when she said well we found something and even though you're groggy you know the only thing I could think of at that point was on a scale of one to ten how concerned are you and she said I'm about an eight and sobered up real quick you know there wasn't any more anesthesia and she said that was a Thursday she said I want to see you back in my office on Tuesday and sure enough Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock is when we got the results yep yeah. exactly what I thought it was it's cancer so from that point um, you know I then went and met with the surgeon and the medical oncologist and you know really started to the following day I had a um, CT scan the day after that I had pre-surgical clearance the day after that I had you know it's just a myriad of tests at that point so, so. It was a whirlwind at that point absolutely yeah. yeah so I know that we talked about symptoms of colon cancer and pain's not high on the list right. thinking back did you see anything else that may have given us a clue change in bowel habits anything like that you know I understand that the, the topic's a little challenging but anything that would give the viewers a clue if they may have colon cancer They're there definitely was um, some blood that I probably had recalled seeing in my stool at some point. Um, you know, unfortunately, being female, I didn't really pay as much attention to it. Um, based on other things that occur so um, but there was I mean changes most definitely um, some I would say almost indigestion type feeling but lower than where you would feel it in your chest and um, but definitely just communicating with my doctors is really what I was fortunate GPs, again yeah now anybody in your family have colon cancer you don't mind us talking about that no 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 yeah and no not at all so um, that's a risk factor we look at and I assume you were pretty healthy no smoking no drinking other things I was training for an Ironman at the time when I was actually diagnosed yeah, so and, and you know. weren't that old either I think you were saying 32? I was, yeah. Which doesn't fit any categories for colon cancer. So this was a great find for the, your doc to pick oh, that up. I so was very fortunate. Very fortunate. Yeah. Um, tell me about the, the overall process of how it's affected you in the past or actually coming up. Yeah. Well, um, as far as the medical mm -hmm. you're talking about, so I um, ended up going to the Mayo. It, we found out it was stage four. It had spread to my liver. So I was fortunate enough to get an um, appointment at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, which is where I went for my surgery. Mm -hmm. um, came back and started chemo um, for six months. And uh, then from there, um, I was on a drug called Avastin for a couple of years afterwards and um, just finished that up about a year or so ago, so almost two. And I haven't um, slowed you down. And I know we um, have a little short minute, but tell me about what you're planning to do. Yeah, so um, at the end of the year, I'm planning on doing um, an Athena Project event, which is um, a three-day event. I've got every day is 20-mile bike, four-mile run, and um, nine-mile kayak. So I did end up competing in that Ironman in two years after I was diagnosed. So cross the finish line at 16 hours, 47 minutes, and 46 seconds. So for you. Definitely was able to con pick back up my physical activity where it left off. Not right away, before. but this is it your did take six, some time. Yeah, this is your sixth year, so yeah. you're definitely doing wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks today. for having me. And that's it for today's in-depth report. By the way.